the Buddha called the qualities that we develop on the path noble treasures or noble wealth. And he was not at all shy about using financial analogies to explain the path, to explain the goal. The Arahant, he said, is someone who's totally without debt, feeds off the alms of the country without debt, he says. And the forest giants carry out this, this image as well. And John Mahabhava talks about being an inner millionaire and the state of mind that you gain it with awakening as a, as a Dhamma treasure. So you hear nothing in the, in the forest tradition about trying to get away from spiritual materialism. They're quite frank about the fact that you want to develop good qualities and that these are really valuable. And John Lee has a nice statement. He says, when you let go, you want to let go like a wealthy person and not like a pauper. The pauper doesn't have a Cadillac, and he says, well, I'll just let go of any desire to have a Cadillac. That's nothing compared to a wealthy person who has the Cadillac and says, I'm going to let that go. Because there's a real Cadillac there. Other people can benefit from it. In other words, the good qualities that you develop in the mind are not only for your own good. You get on the list of noble treasures. You have conviction, virtue, shame, compunction. These are all a set. You believe in the power of action. Basically, you believe that the Buddha really was awakened and that his awakening depended on his own actions and that the qualities he developed to gain that awakening are qualities that we all have in potential form. And so it's through our actions that we can foster them and bring them to that same state of maturity. And virtue grows out of that conviction. You don't want to harm anyone in any way. So you hold by the precepts, the five, the eight, 227 precepts. As a way of making sure that you don't harm yourself, you don't harm others. Shame and compunction are the emotions that keep you in line with those precepts. In other words, you would be ashamed to break the precepts, because you realize you're a better person than that. As a, For compunction, it's the opposite of apathy. Apathy says, I don't care what happens down the line, I'm just going to go for what I want right now. Compunction says, what happens down the line is important, so I've got to be careful what I do right now. I can't just go by my wants. These two qualities, shame and compunction, really are a form of wealth because they protect you in so many ways from doing things that you would later regret. Years back there was a, a radio broadcast that we heard of an old guy who had been a soldier in Vietnam, and apparently he had killed this young girl. And every night, the memory of the young girl that he killed, but for no reason at all, kept haunting him. And as he said to the interviewer, if I could go back, if I can spend a million dollars to go back to undo that, I would do that. I would spend that much money. Which means if you have the shame and compunction not to do those things to begin with, it's worth more than a million dollars. That's the remaining three noble treasures. There's Learning, generosity, and discernment. Learning is your knowledge of the Dharma. And again, you're not the only one who benefits when you know the Dharma. You can share it with others. At the very least, if you act in line with the Dharma, with what you've learned, other people will benefit. Generosity is the way in which it's most obvious that other people benefit from your good qualities. Because you're giving of material things, your time, your knowledge, your energy. You're not just taking from the world, but you're giving good things back. And then finally, discernment, which is the treasure that protects all the others. And there's the, the good karma of generosity, the good karma of virtue. And you can be reborn in really nice places and just have a really good life here on earth, in this human life. But if you don't have discernment, you can take that goodness and abuse it, 
discernment is what helps you see that even the goodness that comes from virtue and generosity is not enough. You need more. And as you develop that discernment, you're a good example to others. And again, your actions don't weigh on them because you're able to see through your own greed, aversion, and delusion and cut it through. So other people aren't subjected to those things. Now there's a point in the path where you take all these noble treasures you've developed and you give them up. Even discernment, that's something at the very end of the path that has to be abandoned as well. The discernment does its work and then you put it down. But this doesn't mean those things are not there. It's just you don't have to hold on to them anymore. And they're there for you to share. Think of the Buddha, all those good qualities he developed, and he shared them with everyone. Forty-five years, walked all over northern India, sharing his wealth. So don't be ashamed of having the idea that you will gain something from the practice. There are so many practice traditions out there that say that you shouldn't have any goals at all. You shouldn't aim at anything, just sort of be in the present moment. That's a letting go like a pauper. You have nothing, and so you let it go. And it's still nothing. And it doesn't take much to let go of nothing. But if you've got a really good treasure, it's quite an accomplishment to use it properly and then let it go. So we're developing all these good things so that they will do their work on our minds and also so they'll have something good left over to give to the world. So when you're meditating tonight, remember that it's for you and for others. What, what are you giving? What do you have to give? Put your mind in really good shape. So the shape of your mind, the state of your mind, is something that you would be happy to give to other people if you're sitting here wondering about what you're going to do tomorrow, wondering about what happened today, thinking about things that are not related to the breath. That's not much of a gift. Try to develop the state of mind that you would be happy and proud to show to somebody else. There are a couple of stories in the tales of the Ajans. A young monk comes to see the Ajahn and talks about how he's been obsessed with sex and can't stop thinking about it. And in one case it's Ajahn Shah, in another case it's Ajahn Tate. In both cases their, their cure for that was to say, okay, well, tomorrow you can get up in the sermon seat and you can tell everybody in the community in great detail what your fantasies are. And in both cases it worked. The monks stopped thinking about those things. So think of your state of mind tonight as a potential gift. Put it in good shape, something that you would be happy to give to others. Because in a way we're giving our minds to everybody all the time. The state of our mind comes out in our actions, in our words. And so people are seeing your state of mind all the time. So without showing off, create inside a really good state of mind, and it'll show itself. And people will find that it is a gift that they're happy to receive. So the best gift you can give, of course, is the gift of a noble treasure. So make your mind into a noble treasure. And it'll spread its benefits all around.